So if, if we try to, what I'm going to talk about in the last couple of minutes is, is how do we factor the, the need to do something much more serious about eating disorders, because I don't really think it is being taken seriously. I mean, it's great to have a national collaboration, you know, a $3 million investment, but you know, we need a much more massive sort of uh, and serious uh, addressing of this issue, and it needs the personnel to do it. it need, we need to find the people who are, you know, who are going to the reinforcements, the cavalry that can actually come o over the hill and help us do this. But it's got to, I think it's got to be done in the context of this more wider mental health reform um, uh, agenda. And what are, what are the features of that? Well, first of all, obviously, if we can prevent things, that's great. And that, that would be the thing we'd, we'd want to try to do. So that means understanding the risk factors and, and targeting them. And if we can't do primary prevention, we've got to do early intervention. And that's something which I think Stephen mentioned, and, and this field is really, I think, strongly uh, behind the idea of early intervention in a really good way. Um, at the back end, if people don't get better, uh, or if, if we're managing a more chronic illness or persistent illness, then we've got to make sure that people are socially included and, and have the right type, range of supports and, and uh, scaffolding to get through life. I think on, on one of those slides that I just skipped over, the average length of an eating disorder is about seven years. So this is, this is um, it's not something that's um, an, an acute or transient type thing in, in, in many people. Consumer focused, how to, how to involve the consumers. There's lots of anxiety about involving consumers, especially in eating disorders. How do you do it without um, exposing their vulnerability and, and causing harm? I mean, these issues have been dealt with in other disorders, I think, pretty effectively, actually. So um, I think that's something we could make more progress on. And probably the most important thing of all is getting the general public to realize it's not just a, you know, a bleeding heart, hearts and minds type issue. It's actually a self-interest issue. That it's going to be your kids, it's going to be your family that's going to be affected. That's the thing that's mobilised the public. It's not, um, it's not enough to have altruistic people uh, involved in this. It's got to be you know, a, a, a genuine self-interest from the community's point of view before it's going to get support. So, and I've probably shown you this slide before. It's the only one ever, anyone ever remembers from any of my talks, sadly, but it's the one that's the most important because you can see it's, what I said before is true. In terms of new cases of mental ill health, or of, of, of uh, physical or mental ill health, um, there's a different pattern for mental, mental ill health, which is in yellow there. You can see there's some childhood problems, um, but there's a big surge to adolescence and early adulthood. This is everything. And I think anorexia in particular is a classic example of this, absolutely classical. Um, it fits this pattern probably better than anything. Um, and, and there's no barrier at 18, there's no magical divide in terms of, you know, <clears throat> the tap gets turned off at 18. <clears throat> and neither is that the case with development. You know, becoming an adult isn't something that, that starts at 12 and finishes at 18. It, it probably starts a little bit earlier than 12, and it finishes definitely much later than, than 18, probably in the late 20s these days. So we've got to, um, we've got to put those two things together in designing cultures of care, uh, those two, two key facts. And mental ill health is really common in young people. Now, some of our critics you know, of this sort of youth focus have tried to say, well, you're just turning the troubled teens, teenage angst, into a medicalized, you know, medicalization of the human condition. Well, that's a very nice ideological thing to say, sitting in your ivory tower, in academic ivory towers. But in the real world, if you talk to parents, if you talk to teachers, if you talk to people who live in the real world, that is not the case. This study from New Zealand followed about a thousand young people from the age of 12 through to 30. And it showed about 50% of young people will experience a diagnosable episode of mental ill health during that period. And you could say, well, it's so common, it's meaningless, you know, um, it's normal. But actually, that's confusing normal with common. You know, it's common to get the flu. You know, it's common to, ha to have physical ill health during this period as well. And no one says you don't deserve to have help or, or, or treatment if you need it. So, um, and this study also shows that these young people, if they had mental ill health during this period, it was directly proportional to their um, human outcomes or social outcomes. So how much money they were earning at age 30 was, was directly proportional to how much mental ill health they had, how many friends they had, how much um, educational success they had. So these are really practical outcomes of, of untreated and unrecognized mental ill health. And obviously eating disorders is one very big 
folk of this. It's, it's one of the expressions of the, the local age group. And the access is terrible, as we've seen. I think this is why the Mental Health Commission, the Reform Commission, endorsed the focus on young people very strongly. It had 14 recommendations, and the top two had to do with you know, youth mental health and early intervention services for serious, more serious illnesses, which obviously shouldn't just be about psychosis, should be every, every potentially serious disorder. <coughs> there are other new, new developments, innovations that are coming into the mix, which I'm sure you're going to talk about, the use of... Um, e-health and uh, as a complementary uh, um, and sort of additional sort of screen, especially for young people. And there are new developments to try to beef up um, this focus because obviously it's very weak. You know, the focus on teenagers and young adults is still very weak. It hasn't, there's a system that wasn't built. So it's an international group of Canadians are involved you know, in, in this process. Um, Simon Davidson from Ottawa was here for three months last year. He's, he's one of the people that's involved. Um, we had a very successful conference to try to get this issue off the ground. Eating disorders was one of the themes in this conference. And even the College of Psychiatrists has, has actually started to move with the times and has set up a special interest group in youth mental health to sort of bridge child and adolescent and adult psychiatry so that people who want to work with young people, whatever their training background, can actually you know, um, work together and actually create some new expertise. because. It's not as though we know everything, is it? I mean, there's lots of stuff we don't know in terms of clinical care, in terms of new research, and, and so on. So those are positive things. And in terms of <coughs> how we get there, this is, this, I'm just showing you this because in parallel with the planning for the, um, the mental health reforms last year in the budget, because it, it was so bureaucratic, we had to set up a, a special, you know, unofficial, you know, like not the expert working group, um, to actually come up with a blueprint to feed into that process. And I think that's what, we'll, what we've got to do in the mental health sector. We've got to actually create you know, a common blueprint which includes the key things that have to be done, but not the usual wish, wish list like our national mental health plans uh, tend to be, just everything's included. We've got to have the things that are the priorities and actually the sequence of, 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 um, of actually implementation. You can't do everything at once. We're not going to get $20 billion. But if we get two or five billion, what are we going to do? Which are the priorities? And what can be done? There's no point, like with partners in recovery, just because we've got to do something about serious uh, and enduring mental illness, just putting $500 million into it, just because it's a need. We've got to have something to invest in, you know, like vehicles. Uh, and I see Kim Ryan sitting there, mental health nursing. I mean, you know, this is an area, there's a program there, ready, ready to go, ready to be expanded. Yeah, we've got better access, we can build on that with more specialisation. There's lots of things that are road tested that could be invested in and um, the field's got to get a bit more mature about supporting you know, things that are you know, likely to succeed, not just you know, fighting for their own little bit of turf. It's got to be much more mature.